Lord Jesus Christ. We warmly welcome you to Monday evening fellowship. This is Christ's Disciples Church, Uganda, and you're warmly welcome. We are going to pray and learn. Almighty and ever living God, the giver of everything. In him, through him, for him, all things hold together. Those in those in heaven and on earth. Father, come and enable all this to hold together according to your will. We sprinkle the blood of Jesus upon our ears so that we can be able to hear very well. We sprinkle the blood of Jesus upon the word so that we shall have the power. All authorities of devils against the word of God be broken, be broken, be burnt, be destroyed, be crushed by the power in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. God is good. And all the time... I want us to learn something called the cross. What is the cross? Why did Jesus say that whoever wants to, whoever wants to follow me, whoever wants to be my disciple, in the book of Matthew, he said, whoever wants to be my disciple should carry up his cross and follow me. What did he mean by us carrying up our crosses and following him? Did he mean that we should carry our burdens and follow him? Anyway, what is the cross? Because some people say that, I have a number of Bibles here. We shall be using about three Bibles. Uh, but I want us to understand what the cross is. What is the cross? Somewhere in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, you can actually hear about the cross. You can hear of things that Jesus was going to speak. You know, this book of Exodus speaks of things, like for example, what Paul spoke about in the book of Romans, where he said that, is the word too far? Is it in heaven? Or is it on earth beneath that no one can collect it? The word of salvation. Then he quotes and says, the word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Which the Bible speaks about in the book of Romans. Then if we check so much, somewhere in the book of Mark again, they speak of the cross. Everything about the cross. Somewhere there, God told uh, Moses when people were bitten by the serpent. Other Bibles say snake. But let's take what the King James Version says, serpent. You know you can be bitten in the spirit realm by the devil. Like some of you dream being bitten by a snake on the leg. Or maybe somewhere in your body. But actually, you may not get a wound on the leg. But you can get frustrations beyond imagination. Or you can get problems beyond imagination. When the serpent has bitten you. Or a snake has bitten you. So somewhere when people are bitten by snakes. Do you know what God told Moses to do? He told all of them. He told him to create a cross, uh, to create a tree, make it in form of a cross. And whoever looked upon it got what? Got saved. But what exactly is the cross? What did Jesus mean by carry up your cross and follow me? We have a lot here to learn or we have a lot to see. Maybe I can, we can read from the book of Romans chapter 3 verses 25. Let me start from NKJV. For purposes of simplifying English, we shall use very many versions. But let me use New King James first here. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 25. What is the cross? Uh, Romans here. 3, 25. This NK... NKJV says um, says okay let me start from verses 23 but I'm interested in verses what? 25. Verse 3 says 23 says for all have sinned and for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I want you to notice the change there. It's all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The falling, even right now, you have still fallen short. Verse 24 says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth, uh, whom God set forth appropriation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because... In his forbearance, God has passed over the sin that were previously committed. 
Romans chapter 3, that's verses 25. Let me read another version also. Let's have as many versions as, as possible. Uh, let's go slowly here. This one here says, it also speaks, I want you to just see one word. Everything here, even in this Bible, they speak, up, they speak of through. God had to do whatever he did, but he did through Christ, and Christ again also was able to fulfill it through his blood. We're also going to read uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 10 to 12. Then we first understand what it is. Hebrews 13. Um, 13 here. I think it's the last verse. Verses 10. 12. Here says, it says, we have an altar, which we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. It continues and says, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Good. I also want us to maybe read uh, one last verse before we talk about it in Isaiah. But before we read all this, when you go back to Exodus, you also see something about this. What is the cross? They tell us uh, almost every person who had, who met we are going to read this in the book of Colossians. In short, the cross is the altar of the world where Jesus had to punish and to cancel all debts of sin. Every human being has a debt, a debt that you have to pay for. And they tell us that the cross of Jesus is the altar of God that God used to punish. Other versions say to cancel all the debts of sin. Now, uh, not just the debts of sin, but every debt that you have. Because God never created anybody to suffer. But how can God show his righteousness? How can he show you favor? Or how can he be good to you, yet you deserve his wrath? So he created something where God himself, you know, what is an altar first of all? An altar is where a spirit meets with a human being. You, you can find it out. You see all altars of demonic people. There's an aspect of, they say, let there be a living thing. Sometimes an altar, uh, a magic altar, for example, they try to create a living thing. They can bring a plant and put there, not just a flower, but they will put a plant, a living plant. Or they can put uh, blood of, for example, chicken. If you know that the chicken can take maybe, how old? Uh, it can take two years to live. So you can sacrifice the life of that chicken. Something living must be in, the, in an altar. Something that never perishes. Like for example, you can put an egg. The gestation period of an egg is 21 days. So every 21 days you must put there an egg. Then you must put a medium in every altar where spirits can be able to communicate, to connect. Isn't that what happens in altars? Demonic altars, that's what it does. And the, every altar is made according to what you're going to do there. If you're going to make a thanksgiving offering, you must make an altar. And the first thing, you must make an altar for thanksgiving. Like I can give you an example. Most of these evil altars, one of the things they do first, they get the direction where that altar is supposed to face. Most altars face east. Most altars where they enchant, they do magic, they cast spells. Uh, a witch doctor, can, not a witch doctor, let's take a small example. A night dancer can come and dance around your uh, whatever, maybe your business, your shop, or anything. It's not just him dancing or that person just dancing around. There are better things that person would be doing. You might take it that he's just dancing, but literally he's not dancing. He's connecting, he's doing something to you. And the power of, because even some of those night dancers don't know what they're doing at that moment. It's because they're under the influence of the other spirit. Every altar has a servant upon it. You know that. Every altar has somebody who has to keep on, to keep it burning. Some people, like us believers, we are now altars. Like Jesus was the altar of God. He had God 
you know he had god he had the holy spirit he had god the father all inside him he was an altar everybody somewhere we shall read in the book of hebrews they say we now offer uh we now meet we now get closer to the throne of god without fear anymore because we ourselves we are altars you yourself you are where the spirit of god can come and meet with your spirit you know uh, you remember in the old testament god gave an instruction a clear instruction to moses and told him to build up an altar not to use stones that are cut but stones that are not cut most of those people who built altars you saw that they used stones that were not cut like uh, this man who was later named Israel he built up but he used stones that were not cut nobody told him but maybe it was the spirit of god who is because he had it in his mind to build an altar just like god told the, somebody called david that you cannot build for me a church your hands are full of blood you know but i will raise up one of your own and I'll put it in him to build a, ta- a temple for me. So certain things that we do, we do them without knowing, but they are good before God. God puts it in you. He speaks to your spirit. So if you check so much, even in the Old Testament, uh, sick people would always go uh, to the church or to the tent of meeting, which I might call a synagogue. And there, there was always a place, uh, an altar where they put the, uh, the tabernacle. And what we shall read it in the book of Leviticus. Every sick person, every person who had the problem, like you can see, um, a woman who a husband, you will read it in the book of in the in the, in the laws. A, if a woman was suspected by her husband for maybe committing adultery, there was something that they would do if they want to remove that suspicion. They would go before again the altar. Then they would get water, and in that water, they would speak curses to that altar. And then they would give the woman to drink that. And, they would, and she would speak herself words like, if it is true that I've committed adultery when, with any other man except my husband, let a sickness affect me, my inner po- body parts. But where were they doing it from? In the altar. So that water would not be just mere water, but it would be water having power of the spirit. That's why they had to go before the priest, and the high priest had to, st- and the priest had to be, in the tent of meeting. The priest would sanctify himself, then they go and do that. And if that woman took that water, and uh, if it were true that she had committed immorality, all those curses, that sickness would come upon her. But if it were not true, that salt water, would, nothing would do. That's why a witch doctor can carry anything, carry your cloth. It's an ordinary cloth. But because he has a, a, uh, an altar, and sometimes it finds that that altar is stronger than your altar. You're a prayer, a believer, but your altar is always cold or your altar does not have the blood this is where the power they say there's power in the cross haven't you read it the whole book of romans from chapter 5 up to the last chapter speaks about power of the cross look at the book of second corinthians from chapter 2 look about look at the book of uh, hebrews from chapter 3 chapter 4 they speak about power in the cross the ultimate power of everything is in the cross and what gives that cross power is the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. We are going to read somewhere here, like we read, we started last week, that God saw it fitting to punish, to, to punish Christ so that he can make you righteous. That's why the Bible speaks about it in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. It's Paul was speaking and saying, I am the righteousness of God through Christ. But how does Christ sanctify you? Does Christ sanctify you by just speaking? No. How does Christ sanctify your life, your marriage, your business, your job? How does Christ give you victory? How are you able to get all these things? They say that all the promises of God are yes and amen. Through Christ. Through Christ. If you carry Christ, you are indeed a disciple of Christ. Because if you carry Christ, if you carry the blood of Christ, if you carry Christ inside you, a spirit of Christ, the only thing that can enable you to carry two spirits is the cross. I don't know if it makes sense. But the only thing that can accommodate, can enable you to handle two spirits. That's why if somebody has, wants to cast a spell on you, he has to first maybe give you something to eat, defile you first. Like I can give you an example. I was hearing some which, proudly speaking, how, was able, how they are able nowadays to destroy men. They just go and make 
Actually, this particular man, how they are able to destroy him, they just went into his fridge and defiled his food. And they knew the nature of the man, that he does not pray for whatever he drinks. So they just got the drinks he loves, those ones that he considers to be small, and they defiled him. What happened next? They were able to give him a sickness. You see, they just need to defile you. They need to create sin inside you. Here we're going to read in the book of Exodus where God commanded the Israelites to sit, to arrange themselves in a position that makes the cross. You saw it. To make a cross. So that when he sees you from heaven, however much this man was trying to cast, to defile the Israelites, he was unable. Now you check yourself. Do you really feel you're carrying the cross of Jesus inside you? Something that can enable God to exchange. Even when God wants to give you something good, there must be a place where the exchange, where we come, because a spirit being and a physical being, there's a, there is a way they connect. The way you greet a spirit is not the way you greet a human being. You touch a human being and you feel that you've touched somebody. But what about a spirit? Because God is a spirit, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, I want you to take time, read it from chapter 3. They speak of the nature of God, that God is a God of consuming fire. Now, how can God, a God of consuming fire, connect up with you, who is not a God of consuming fire? Look at Manoah. Look at this, the father of, of, of Samson. You know, this man, the wife this day, the wife was at the altar. The altar, and she had sacrificed her animal very well, her bull, her goat. And what happened? An angel of God came. A spirit was able to connect with her. So how can the gifts that God wants for you to connect, how can they connect with you? How can the happiness of God connect with you? As a matter of fact, where there's no altar, we're going to read somewhere here, in the book of Colossians, where there's no connection between the spirit of God and your spirit, there's a connection between the spirit, your spirit and the spirit of darkness. Where there's no connection between you and God, and what even creates that connection? It's the cross of Jesus, only Jesus. Everybody had to first make a, an altar. God came to Gideon. The first thing was to tell Gideon to connect and to make a what? An altar. Abraham made an altar. Everybody made an altar. But that was physical altars. We shall read it here in the book of Hebrews. Those were physical altars that had to be constantly having light. And they were supposed to sacrifice blood on it daily. Now you, you ought to have an altar. Jesus has already given you the altar. And he says, you must carry that altar daily and follow him. Without that altar, you cannot follow him because there will be no exchange. And if there's no exchange, if you cannot follow Christ, you're not a disciple of Christ. Somewhere in the book of Psalms, they say that God has made his servants flames of fire. How can God make you a flame of fire? How can God even give you that heart's desire of yours that you have if there's no connection between you and him? We shall read in the book of Psalms, though not now. Okay, in simple terms, an altar is a market. Let's take it like that. Where you come with your money, then you go back with happiness. Or you go and buy food. You don't go back with money. You leave the money there. Then you come back with the food. An altar is that. Where you come with whatever is disturbing you. How can you actually bear the fruits, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, such as joy? If you yourself have not drawn closer to the altar of God, Jesus plainly said, not whoever says, Lord, Lord. Not whoever knows the name of Christ. As a matter of fact, even said, many will come and say, we preached your name, in your name. So you cannot preach. You have all, you can preach, you can know everything about God. But there's no connection between you and God. There is no altar. We shall read it here where he has made us living sacrifices. So we are the ones that are supposed to be on that altar. We are supposed to be on the cross. Somewhere the Bible says we have crucified ourselves on the cross. God has already given us an altar. God has already given us, he has already showed you the market. Why are you still struggling that you have nowhere to buy clothes from? Go to the market and buy clothes. It's just like, um, I always tell people, you can lack something because you don't know where it is. But if you know that uh, what I need is there, you can start, you can go there and pick it. Sometimes you can go there and negotiate for it. So the whole power of Christianity is, is in the unity between you and Christ. In the unity between the spirit of God and the spirit of, 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 of Christ. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 
in the altars of witch doctors, magicians, sorcerers. Have you, did you read in the book of Exodus where these people were able to cast snakes and everything? There was that part of the Bible, of the word, that says, using their sacred art, the, 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 the magician and sorcerers also dropped their sticks and it became snakes. You hear, using their sacred art, they were able to also bring the frogs from the, from the water, but they were unable to return them. Uh, using their sacred arts. Whatever this man did using the power of God, the other man also did using their sacred art. So they also have altars, but there is always an altar that is powerful more than others. But what is an altar? There is that market that is more powerful than others. Why is it very powerful? Because of the administration, because of the owners of the market. So they say somewhere here that all our, we, all our debts, what are the debts that our bodies have? Like problems, sicknesses, all those things that you know. You go to the altar of Christ. You come in union with Christ. And once you unite with Christ, if Christ is fire or if he's light, he will be able to light you up, light up your whole soul, light up your whole life, and you'll have the light of Christ. And that altar, no altar can work against it. It's the battle of connection. Which spirit are you connected with? Praise the Lord Jesus. That's why it tells us somewhere, even these are the things that you can get from the altar. These are the things that you can get from the cross, which is the altar for all believers. Because the cross is not the altar for witch doctors. No, it's the, the cross is that place where you go to buy. That's why somewhere the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, come now and buy freely. But is there any, is, have you ever seen anywhere where they buy things for free? And after that, it continues and says, he bore your infirmities. You just read a few verses, then you reach where he says, he bore your infirmities. Do you have any infirmity? In fact, when you read here, in the book of Second Corinthians, maybe we should read it, chapter 13, verses 4. It says that all of us have weaknesses. Let's try reading Corinthians. Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Chapter um, Second Corinthians, um, Chapter Thirteen, verses Four. Here it says, It says, For though he was crucified in weakness, uh, in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards us. This is what I want you to see. For we also are weak, but we shall live by, but we shall live with him by the power of God. So there, for you to connect with the spirit of Christ, that's when you can live with him. And when you live with him, the power of God will be available for you to use. Even when Jesus was giving people authority, he did not hand anybody or did not shake anybody's hand or he did not lay his hands on people's heads. He just spoke. You know, that's why the Bible says in the book of John that my words are a spirit. So you must have a connection where your spirit with their spirit connects. Actually, even the Bible tells us in the book of Corinthians where the spirit of God is, there is freedom. Has the spirit of God connected with you? If the spirit of God has not there will still continue to be op there will still be oppression. There will be no freedom. What are we trying to say here today? What are, what do we mean by the cross of God? Since we have understood that the cross of God is a point of connection, I'm still emphasizing. A, we have, since we have understood that the cross of God is an altar, is an altar, and we have known that an altar is anything that joins up two spirits. Anything that joins up to spirits. And we have read here that all of us have weaknesses. And this is what Paul was speaking. And the Paul, uh, the apostle was more powerful than some people right now. Perhaps even more powerful than you. Now, if Paul, who was more powerful than you, says that we have weaknesses. But again, if we live with Christ together, we shall have the power of God available for us. So what we know, most of us always want the power of God. We want the goodness of God. We want to see the goodness of God. But have we done the things that can enable us to be there? Most people want 
you know for example uh, to be farmers but do you know what it takes to be a farmer uh, most people want to go to heaven but do you know what it takes to go to heaven or what you ought to do just like most people right now are reading all books of how to be happy i was glad i saw a small con- comment the other day where one man one author wrote a book of how to be successful how to be mm, successful how to learn your wife how to make your how to make your life how to make your life better in 30 days the title of the book was how to make your life better how to make your life better in 30 days that man wrote that book some man in us wrote a book how to make your life better in 30 days and f- from the day they published that book in about 28 days it sold about 5 million copies then when the owner of the book came to find out why he realized that there was a mistake in his book the title of the book was how to make your life better but the man make a made an error in typing and he wrote how to make your wife better in 30 days and because the title was how to make your wife better in 30 days it made 5 million copies he sold 5 million copies in 28 days so many people are looking of how to make their wives better so the best way is just simple just unite with god leave it to christ after all it's christ's duty if you live with christ that's when you shall be able to get the fullness of christ but now how do you live with christ because the bible says somewhere in the book of ezekiel jesus said god said come i shall p- come even if you have sins i shall purge you i shall cleanse you i shall wash you somewhere in the book of isaiah also he says come and we settle the matter even if your sins are as red as scarlet so the first thing is you connecting with god this is what we are talking about them praying for you to receive salvation is not a connection between you and god that's why you can have very many people who have stayed in salvation until they say i think i you know when you start even having doubts so why try elsewhere why should get another person to pray for me that's a sign that you are failing to connect with god and they said the lack of knowledge is why many people will perish is why the children of god will, will perish now this is what we are learning about now how do you connect how do you use this altar which is the 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 cross which is the cross of jesus christ how do you also carry it wherever you go and you follow jesus because jesus says follow me and jesus is the way you are supposed to walk on him or in him he's the way to life and they say jesus gives life and life in abundance so for you to walk in him you must carry this connector that connects you and christ so because you, your sins cannot be forgiven before you even reach the cross isn't that what is written in the book of isaiah you're supposed to reach at the cross even somewhere in isaiah they say after your sins have been forgiven your burdens are dropped you shall hear a voice that turn here turn there now how, the point is how do you reach there how do you also start listening to the voice of god it doesn't matter who you are you can be very fluent in the bible but if you have a small connection between you and god because one day you accidentally prayed and washed yourself with the blood or you accidentally prayed in the blood and you got a slight connection and let me tell you something the, if you hear the testimonies or the stories of these demonic people they're out there breaking connections between god and people they are even telling people you need to sleep with a cross deceiving people with this ordinary cross the cross of the lord jesus is the altar of the world whoever wants to unite with god must have the cross now these are the things that you that are always in an altar like i told you an altar must have a living sacrifice or a living thing you have always seen maybe uh places where like um, blood let me give an example somewhere the bible tells us that we should have the blood of jesus which is for the remission of sins forever and ever it's a, a living sacrifice that lives forever and ever so that is the blood symbolizes a spirit like when you go to these magicians deep sorcerers who can who fast for like a, a week or seven days you'll always hear that in their altar there is always blood and that blood is being there's always blood then there's always usually a, a spirit for them they call that spirit a prophet and usually that prophet is a fallen angel or a high ranking demon 
Like if that person is fighting the finance of another person, he will have to get just a spirit, maybe spirits of poverty, and they have to have a commander, uh, maybe like a fallen angel or these high-ranking angels, who will always command these other demons. These ones go and spy, these ones go and frustrate, these ones go and remove morale. I know you are aware of those spirits that go to remove morale. Like when you read in the book of Exodus, some, we read it some time back. Jesus, the only way he frustrated the Israelites, not the Israelites, the, the Egyptians. He just told Moses, it is simple. I shall go there and I shall frustrate their plans and remove their morale. And that's a simple weapon. And by the way, you can use that. If you have your enemies who are disturbing, you can just even pray like that. And God, go and frustrate their plans against me and remove their morale. That's why the Bible says the weapons of God are not seen, they are not carnal, but they are mighty in the pulling down of strongholds. Just imagine if you have a quarreling woman, just pray and say, God, go and remove her morale of quarreling. Do you think that's a very good weapon? How many times have you prayed like that? Just imagine if you have, a, a, an, you know, mothers-in-law usually have problems with the daughters-in-law. Just imagine a daughter-in-law today. You don't stand firm to argue and see who is the best. You just can't say, God... Can you go and frustrate her plans against me and remove her morale of quarreling? Then from nowhere she comes in nowadays she no longer quarrels. If God himself used these weapons, what about you? you remember how Deborah prayed her prayer? When she pleaded asking this man, I've forgotten his name, to go with her for battle. But the man didn't go. He refused. Deborah went and prayed. And he asked God, she made a small simple prayer. And you know God answered with the whole world. The whole world had to come and help Deborah fight. It rained on the enemies. You know, it was just too nice. Develop. And I want to tell you the truth. We are fighting. The Bible tells us in the book of, I think, Ephesians 6, that we are fighting spirits. But the one thing you need to know clearly, if you've been losing these battles, is spirits don't fight the way we fight. You are fighting spirits. If they tell you you're fighting spirits, you need to know something serious there. They don't tell you how to fight in the book of Ephesians there. They just tell you that you're fighting spirits, you're fighting principalities. Then somewhere in Corinthians, they tell you how to fight them. Like, they tell us that the weapon is not seen, but it is mighty. And the, like, for example, in the book of Corinthians, they tell us that there's a weapon that is used for pulling down arguments. Why do you keep arguing yet you have a weapon? Hallelujah. Let's go back to the cross. Uh, at the, in the Old Testament, we're going to read here in the book of Exodus that he, you would go with your sickness and lay your head, your, if you're sick, that whoever was sick or whoever was found sick in the camp of the Israelites was supposed to bring a goat or a sheep, uh, uh, a lamb, blemish, and he's supposed to bring it to the high priest. Then the high priest would examine it. Even the book of Leviticus is still there. The high priest would examine it. Then tell the, that person who has sinned to lay his hands on it. Then he would pray. But they are doing all that in the tent of meeting, in the altar of God. Then they were to sacrifice that animal, then get its blood. Not so? And sprinkle sometimes over the altar. Then why would they sprinkle over the altar? Why don't they sprinkle that blood over you? And why do you just lay your head, then you go back and get healed? Are those the things we are doing right now? Even you go and lay your, your head over the Lamb of God. Because the Bible tells us somewhere in the book of Revelation. The lamb that liveth forever. So Jesus Christ is still a lamb and he still lives forever. You also lay your hands there and you also pray things that you want to happen to you. Because in the other altar, the high priest would speak from today henceforth. You know, actually God commanded them, Exodus 26, you shall bless the children of God like this. So the high priest would speak blessings upon you for whatever reason you've come with. Then that blood is sprinkled on the altar. Then the offering burnt. You see? So even you, that's what you're supposed to do. Get the blood of Jesus. Carry all your burdens upon it. I can give you very many testimonies over the blood of Jesus ever since I learned of it. Or ever since I experienced it. Any pain, just put there the blood of Jesus. And you see. Any pain. And do you know that the blood of Jesus is the only... Is, that's where the power, every power of Jesus is. And there is power... They say that Jesus was put above all authority, dominion, everything. In fact, in the book of Colossians, there we shall read, um, chapter 2. It says that he, the blood of Jesus, has, has 
it has been given supremacy over all powers. Can you imagine? Do you know the meaning of supremacy? So that's what I want us to know. I want us to know that there's a cross. And that cross lives inside you. And that cross should have always the blood of Jesus. So we can say that your prayer is the con connection between you and God. So then the blood of Jesus, if your prayer is the connection between you and God. Some people's altars were altars of offerings. Some people would just offer very well. And that would create a connection between them and God. Some people would sing so well and it would create a connection. Some people would do, there are many things that you can do to please God. And that thing that you do that pleases God can give you a connection to God. So where there's that connection? Right now, put there the blood of Jesus. David was very good. But when you go and read his, his life in the book of Corinthians, not Corinthians, 2 Samuel, you'll always hear him sacrificing, 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 then he, he goes before God. Solomon, after sacrificing, pouring blood, sacrificing those bulls, God, God came to him at night and asked him for whatever he needed. So that was a connection. His, go, his giving or his sacrifice was a connection. Giving all those bulls, giving part of his wealth was uh, a sacrifice uh, to God. It was an altar, an exchange where God was able to, you know. Now, to keep that altar moving, you need to keep the blood of Jesus there. Because there's no blood of anything that can give people success. That's why I was telling you from the beginning that somewhere God told the Israelites, he told Moses, just create a tree and f make it in form of a cross. Then whoever looks and to eat, whoever looks and to eat, would be what? Would be, would be healed from the snake, from the bites of the serpent, not of the snake. Hallelujah. That's why I want you to know, I want you to start, starting now, starting today, even when you're praying, does your altar have a sacrifice? A living sacrifice? The living sacrifice we have is the blood of Jesus. I want you to, even if you don't, even if you've not understood what I've been saying, from today onwards when you're praying, just soak yourself in the blood of Jesus. Pray with the blood of Jesus. You know, they even tell us that we do not know how to pray. Oh, we do not know what to pray for. Can you imagine they tell us that it is the spirit of God who confirms with our spirit that we are children of God. That means we don't even know that we are children of God. Hallelujah. So the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world, which is the cross. The cross is the altar of the world. Somewhere it continues and says, so that we can be the righteousness of God. But your righteousness is not on your own, it's through Christ. Your righteousness does not come through you doing uh, good things. But it is through the blood of Jesus that's what gives you righteousness. The blood of Jesus is what gives you righteousness. The blood of Jesus is what makes you holy. And it's, that's why, let's take an example. Mon, many of us always quarrel with God and everything. Like, uh, let's read maybe one verse. We have uh, spoken too much without reading. Let's read Psalms uh, 22. Psalms 22 here tells us something. Do you know that every sinner should call unto God and God should pay a deaf ear? Isaiah tells us that. It says, who has asked for your prayers? Who has asked for your sacrifices? It says, uh, like Isaiah chapter 1, start from verses 5. It says, your prayers, they, I will not listen to the multitude of your prayers. When you pray, lifting up your hands to me, I shall hide my eyes. So even when you come and pray and humble yourself, you bend your neck, you know, you kneel down, God shall hide his eyes. Hmm? Your prayers are like smoke to my nostrils. Can you imagine? You're trying to pray very well, but your prayer is like smoke because it has sin. But look at everybody who prays with a sin. And remember the Bible says all of us are, have sinned. Romans tells us all have sinned and lost the glory of God. Look at, like, for example, Psalms 22 here. Uh, let's read from verses what? Let's start from verses 1. The cross is where God exchanged. Here it says, uh, verses 1 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night, in the night season, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. You know, 
it says, these are the things that every sinner should be, every person should be going through. You should be calling unto God and God should not listen to you. God should actually forsake you. If you look at yourself. You know, everybody who is in the world is under, everybody who is in this world is a sinner. That's why even Jesus when he came, he was called a sinner, it wasn't a sinner. He was, they say, he was, he knew no sin. So all of us should be praying and God should not listen to us. As a matter of fact, he should forsake you and forsake you as many times as possible. But when you continue reading this, this is about this is the message of the cross. At that cross is where even a sinner, when he's stealing, he can say, God, remember me also. Can you imagine the other man on the cross with Jesus Christ? He spoke and said, when you reach your kingdom, remember me. When you reach your kingdom, remember me. And did Jesus, what did Jesus reply? He said, today, today in paradise, you, 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 you shall be with me. Today, today, today. You know a day has 24 hours and they had spent about 6 hours. Ah, it was about 6. Ah, it was about midday. You know, it was about midday. They are about 11 something. Maybe 11.30 because their conversation, I think, lasted for 30 minutes and Jesus died. I just think so. So it was about 11 a.m. Where that man told Jesus, you know, uh, you remember me when you reach your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, today, such a sinner who was caught in the act and even shouldn't, Jesus shouldn't have listened to him. He should have ignored him. Just the way the scriptures say here. But because of the cross, Jesus was right there paying debts. Just like when you go to a shop and you find that day the LOC has decided to tell, or when you enter in the restaurant, and that day the, the owner of the restaurant has said, eat everything you want. We shall pay, but don't carry. So if you enter at that moment, you will eat everything you want. And you will not pay. Just like if you go to the hospital and they say, today we are treating everybody freely, increasing, giving people more blood if you want. You shall get. If that, that uh, promotion is still there, the owner has said so. So the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that even now, even now, approach that seat. Approach God with boldness. For there is still mercy. The blood of Jesus is a living uh, sacrifice. Otherwise, they wouldn't have told. But why does the Bible speak of a sacrifice anyway? A living sacrifice. Why did God put it in the hearts of people? Like Noah, the first thing to always do is to offer sacrifices. And I want you from today henceforth, start covering your body with the blood of Jesus. Your health with the blood of Jesus. You know, life is in the form of a sphere. We have very many dimensions, very many things that make up life. We have about four things that make up life. Like, for example, when you read the book of Proverbs, they say that even wisdom is a spirit and it lives in a person. They again speak and say, understanding is also a spirit and it also works hand in hand with wisdom. And they say understanding is a principal thing. Then they again speak of discretion or discernment. They say, she shall hug you if you have wisdom. So this one also comes, it's another spirit that comes and lives in you if you have the other, other two spirits. So life is made up of very many spirits. It's made up of very many spirits that live inside this one big body, one big house. And then the more spirits you have, the kind of life, that's what determines the kind of life you have. That's why Jesus said, we knock there, we are knocking at your door. Whoever opens, we shall come and sup. God is constantly wanting that connection between you and him. And that connection is on the cross, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a sacrifice that can help you to simplify all these things. I'm not telling you to build an altar. Jesus has already built an altar. For example, the Bible tells us here in the book of Corinthians, Galatians, cast is every man hanged on a tree. So all curses that you're having from your parents, friends, relatives, you know, uh, bosses, workmates, and I want you to be careful of that because even the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes that be careful of what you speak because a bird can easily go and report to your boss or to your master the curses that you speak. So most times people are cursing you and those curses take effect. If the person is evil, that evil curse <coughs> sticks to you. But the Bible tells us that curse is any man hanged on a tree. So Jesus has taken all these curses 
and put them on the cross. So your work is to use the blood of Jesus to continue renewing, to continue polishing this cross. They built the Ark of the Covenant once. And then they, what was, what was that on the mercy seat? If you remember, when you go back and read how they, what they told them to do. The mercy seat was something on top of that box. They called it the mercy seat, but as a matter of fact, it was not a seat. They built two cherubims, one which were facing one another, with their wings touching one another, and all of them were facing the mercy seat. Then what was the mercy seat? The mercy seat was just a drop of blood. Can you imagine? All that altar, everything, wherever they would put that, they had something called the mercy seat. The blood was the ultimate thing. The blood of Jesus is the ultimate thing to your everything. After all, they tell us that every battle that we see was won by the blood. I, let me tell you some small confession I had from one sorcerer in South Africa here, a, a witch, who actually entered into things not knowing. Before I even tell you that story, you remember when problems were going to pass? Just like right now, there's a problem, pandemics are passing, red eye sickness, yellow fever. There are many sicknesses that we can't count. God commanded all Israelites, rich, poor, young, old, to sacrifice, to, to get blood and put on their doorposts. And you're supposed to learn from that. Because the same God who told them to do is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So he told them, he commanded all of them. He didn't tell them what was going to pass. But he told them at midnight. He told them to get blood and put on the doorpost. He told them, even those ones who don't have blood, let them go and borrow from the neighbor and put some blood on their doorposts. Remember, if there is a door to every spirit. There's a door to every house. There's a door, even you, a human being, there's a door to your life. You know? And you, where you're going, you may not see them physically, but there are doors that you're entering in. The one the Bible speaks about, God speaks about it in Isaiah. He says, I open a door that no man closeth. Which were those doors you are speaking about? So here we are speaking, you also get the blood of Jesus and put it over, rub it over your health. Because your health is not this, your health, there is a spirit that gives you good health. And that spirit, they, when they carry infirmities from that spirit, remember some, some of us are carrying very many burdens of, this body can accommodate very many spirits, you know that. Now when the spirit is killed, that area of your life is killed. Whether you do what, whether you do what. But what restores is the blood of Jesus. Even somewhere there in these prophecies where God was saying, I shall restore Zion. You read all that. Even uh, Ezra, before he built, the first thing was to offer sacrifices. You, uh, before you pray, or as you're praying, how much of the blood of Jesus have you used as a living sacrifice? How much of the blood of Jesus have you used? If not, you shall continue saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just as this man prayed. This was actually a prophecy, Psalms 22. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Simply because they're not using the blood of Jesus. The blood of the living sacrifice. The blood that lives forever and ever. The blood that gives us redemption. The blood that gives us victory over all things. And that victory is on the cross of Jesus. You already have, some of you already have the cross. Some of you already have prayer. Some of you are trying to live a godly life. You can pray. You can meditate. You can sing. You know, you have reached there. But there is no good exchange. There is no connection. He bore our infirmities on his body. Let's try to read this scripture here. Second Peter. Let's read Peter chapter 2. Let's read first Peter chapter 2. Verses 14. Then we we'll go to Colossians. And as a matter of fact, if you don't know, that is not the blame of God. God does not blame you. Especially if God has given you eyes to see. And especially if God has given you a mind. It's your role to look for it. Let's read Peter. First Peter, where is it? First Peter chapter 2, 14. Or 24, chapter 2. Um, I'm going to just keep and go up to 24 only for our time. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? 24, 24. 
It says here, For he himself bore our sins in his own body, on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. By those stripes you were healed. Now this is the point I want, where he says, Who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. He carried your sins and took it on the tree. So, that tree was not just a mere tree. And him coming inside your body to pick your sins, because he did not carry it, uh, he carried all the weaknesses. I know some of you, stress doesn't leave you. Month in, month out, stress. Right now, stress has just become a normal. Even when you tell your relatives that I'm stressed, it's normal. They don't get shocked because it's not shocking anymore. Some of you, when you get angry, it does not shock your people because you always get angry. As a matter of fact, it's now a habit to you. And that's how the devil ties us into slavery. So he bore our infirmities. I like the scriptures in the book of Colossians. Um, upon the cross, when you go to the cross of Jesus and you sprinkle the blood of Jesus, which takes or which pays or which cancels. Let's read Colossians chapter um, Colossians. Maybe let's let me use NKJV. Colossians. You know how I like chapter two of Colossians. Colossians. Chapter two, verses only fourteen. It says uh, where is it? Verses fourteen it says, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us which was contrary to us you know i like this scripture it says others say having paid the debts you know removing things removing all the charges against you which are contrary to you there are things that we want but they don't come to us there are things that we desire but we don't get them sometimes you actually get a desire of another person you can be desiring what happiness uh then you don't get happiness. You get another person's thing. Uh, for example, another person might be desiring what? Desiring studies to maybe have a PhD or a, a doctorate in maybe uh, developmental studies. You know, you are desiring maybe marriage, but you're not getting marriage. You're rather getting studies. So there are those things that are contrary to what you want. And they happen so many times. You see when the Bible tells us in the book of uh, Galatians, the things that I do not want to do are the very things I do. Can you imagine? The things I don't want are the things that I, I do. The things I don't want to experience are the ones I experience. Can you imagine? Some people might not want to be uh, presidents or kings. They want to be maybe a good musician, but you find yourself as a king. And you must live a humble life. A king does not speak any holy. You know? There are those things that are contrary to things that we want. And what can remove that? It's still the blood of Jesus. What am I trying to speak in all this? As you approach the throne of God, you go to the throne of God, you go to the before God, one of the things that can help you to even pray well is first the blood of Jesus. That helps you. That removes, remo for example, because here they are telling us the blood of Jesus is what cancels the debt, is what removes the handwriting that is, makes us receive things that are contrary to us, things that we don't want, things that are opposite to what we want. And sometimes you have no authority over it. It's the blood of Jesus that gives you some authority. It's the blood of Jesus that aligns you. It's the blood of Jesus. Once that cleans you, and once you're clean, you can now stand with the Spirit of God. You can now talk to God face to face. The way the Bible says in worship. You can now talk to God face to face because of the blood of Jesus. Now, God will not be seeing you. He will be seeing Christ that's why they say we are the righteousness. The Bible in the book of 1 John speaks of the blood of Jesus. The book of Peter, yeah, 2 Peter speaks of the blood of Jesus. For it, God does not see you. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians here tells us, even our righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. So when God looks at you, you are too not good to God. So the blood of Jesus can enable him to see the righteousness of God. Instead of seeing you directly. Just like we gave examples where people like Solomon sinned, then he said, but for your father's sake. You know, those people, the Jeroboams, people like Asa, King Esa or Asa, you know, even Jehoshaphat, just because 
for your father's sake, because your father walked right, yes, right yes, upright before me. Obed Edom. You see, by the most of these things, God sometimes even just earth, earthly people, earthly people. God, some you you can do all the wickedness, but God may not see your wickedness. He will see for the other other person because of the sacrifice, the amount of happiness the other person had first of all put before God, the amount of unity God had with the other person, the friendship they had. Now imagine how much friendship does God Almighty have with Jesus Christ? How much unity do they have? Now, if you put the life of Jesus before your own, you try to carry the cross of Jesus, you carry the life of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is all over you. Just imagine how much God will desire to hug you, desire to be with you, desire to commune with you, desire to, you know, dine with you. Hallelujah. That's why we have different faiths. Praise the name of the living God. So the cross is unto us power. And that power comes through the blood of Jesus. Because any altar without a sacrifice, a any altar, any altar without a sacrifice is nothing. Any altar without a, a spirit behind it is nothing. What are altars? Also, altars just help us to, commun to connect with the spirits. A demonic altar, like as I, you take time and have a look at um, any evil person. He always has a way to connect with spirits. Some people have, have sacrificed sleep and they don't sleep at all. That's the sacrifice he puts in the altar. But for us, we have been given one, 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 and one sacrifice, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. And they tell us that that sacrifice does much more than you can ever imagine. For example, these scriptures, that these promises of God that are yes and amen, but how do they come to us? Through the blood. Even Abraham poured the blood on the cross. He sacrificed. He even sacrificed his, his himself because he had to, you know, uh, he had to, God made a covenant with him and told him, you go and what? And, circ and he circumcised. And he went and circumcised. Somewhere Moses' son, they had to circumcise the son because somewhere an angel of death wanted to kill Moses. And the, what did the woman do? Immediately he knew that Moses, he just got the child and sacrificed, they circumcised the boy and just put the that, uh, skin of the, of the boy and to drop the blood unto Moses and he did not die. And from then henceforth she named Moses who? A bridegroom of blood now you in everything you do uh do you have the blood of jesus there or not what sacrifice do you have is that sacrifice strong if you see witches when this witch is fighting with the other this one can sacrifice a bull if this one has sacrificed the goat the one of the bull this blood has more power than this one it has more life force than this one because life is spiritual and we are fighting spirits you the sickness you're fighting with how much blood have you poured there because you as you don't have any power. Power belongs to God. Some tells us that. And all power belongs to God. Not even small power. Jesus said somewhere in the book of Matthew. All power has been given to me. That was after he came, after he died. All power has been given to me after he poured his blood. Matthew 28. There is all power in the blood. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Corinthians, it pleased God to put his fullness in Christ. So even when Christ died on the cross, it was not only Christ, but it was God Almighty and all his power on the cross just for you. Sometimes you need to sit down and ask yourself, who am I that God did all this for? Who am I that after him struggling to give me this liberty, he has even brought people to preach to me so that I can know of this. It's just that I'm, who, who are you really? You, are, you found yourself in church, you have found yourself watching this, who are you? God is struggling. He loves you so much. He's struggling hard to see that you don't miss this. He has given you a longer grace period, maybe 18 years. You're listening, though you're not yet saved. Because salvation is inside the heart. It's not how many works you do. Because many people can do what you're doing. Many people can be good. But salvation is inside the heart. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in short, we have spoken of what connects you to God, and what you have to offer. It's the blood of Jesus. It's just a continuation of what we started last time. Sprinkle the blood of Jesus upon everything. You have started struggling. The blood is there. It has not yet lost its energy. It has not yet lost its power. Praise the name of the living God. Let's stop there. Tomorrow, Tuesday, there's another fellowship. Same time, same place. Please watch. Wednesday also, there's another fellowship. 
let's watch until when we grow into the full stature of God. It's your responsibility to grow in the spirit. It's not my responsibility. It's not your parents' responsibility or your pastor's. It's your own responsibility. That's why you'll pay for it individually. God bless you. Above all, God loves you. Jesus is about to come back.